Okay, I'm at Kobe. Amazing place to be. As many times as I've been in this room, I gotta tell you, this is the time I've been the most nervous. I wasn't nervous when they called me till I went online and found out that sometimes 100,000 people view TED Talks. Talk about pressure to get it right about homelessness. Talk about pressure to get it right about success and not failure, it's huge. The opportunity of being here today is awesome. A chance to impart 30 seconds of wisdom. No one expects to be homeless. I would estimate that, you know, junior high, high school, somebody sits down with you and says, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would guess that most people don't say, I want to be homeless. I would guess that they say they want to be doctors or lawyers, teachers, parents, politicians, whatever it might be, but no one expects to be homeless. So how do you end up homeless? Let's think about that for a moment. When I grew up, I thought that everybody that was homeless was a skid row drunk, a veteran that came home with mental illness, or an old woman pushing a shopping cart talking to herself with layers of clothing and a dog hidden in the cart someplace, because that's what I'd seen on TV. Today at the shelter, I see a different face of homelessness. I see women and men. I see families. 50% of the homeless persons in the state of Maine this year are homeless families with children. That's an enormous amount of people wondering where they're going to lay their head every day. That's an enormous amount of insecurity for children to deal with. In the state of Maine, over 8,000 people will be homeless this year and have been some number around 8,000 since 2007. That's a lot, 8,000 people a year. And those are the ones that we count. They're not the ones that double up on a couch, that are staying with a family, that have rubbed together two nickels to stay in a motel a few nights. Those are people that stay in the 1,000 shelter beds in our state. So if there's 8,000 homeless in our state, and we have less than 1,000 shelter beds, on any given night, one of those families is still in the cold. For me, that's unacceptable in the United States. I'm born and raised and from the most incredible country ever. But we have homeless vets, homeless children, homeless elderly, homeless students, homeless youth, homeless everybody you could imagine. Somebody's brother, somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's aunt. They're the face of homelessness. If you do not know a homeless person, someone that you have met since you were born will be homeless. Think about those odds. Somebody that you went to school with, somebody that you played with, someone that you shared your life with. The numbers are there. Somebody will be homeless that you know. For me, that changed the face of homelessness. When I met people that I knew, when a person came to the shelter that I went to school with in third grade, and we laughed and played and did hopscotch together, told each other our secrets, and she showed up on the shelter door homeless, it changed the face of homelessness in ways I didn't imagine. The invitation is to learn who's homeless, who's homeless in every community. I think that I grew up with old images, and I think as I got older, I put blinders on like a racehorse. And life was so busy and fast that I just went forward, and I didn't look left, and I didn't look right. And I think that also if we acknowledge that homeless person on the street, there's some moral fiber inside us that says, there's somebody homeless, what can I do? I need to make a difference. Ah, but with blinders? We can forget they're there, we can make them invisible. Sometimes homeless people, when they come to the shelter, they tell stories about where they can stay on winter days. And they say, you know, for 45 cents, I can sit at Burger King for an hour and a half and drink coffee. After that, I need to move along because I'm not a customer any longer. I can go to the library, I can use the computer for 20 minutes, but then it's somebody else's turn. I have to move along. I can walk along a local business and look like I'm window shopping, but after a few minutes, I'm asked to move along. The homeless of our communities become invisible, out of sight, out of mind. When we can't see things, we don't do anything about things. The invitation is to open your eyes, to take your blinders off, to see the homeless of your community and mine. I was reading a national statistic from the National Alliance on Homelessness. It says that 94 out of every 200 people in the United States are homeless or at imminent risk of being homeless. That's almost half our population. The economics are so hard. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the economics. 
Most of the time when you come into a local shelter in Maine, they assist you in finding work. They say, let's go look for work. Let's do a resume. Let's do an employment workshop. Let's work with a career center. Let's do something that changes the employment of a person. So last night in the shelter that I work at, there are 11 folks that are employed. Those 11 folks work 18 to 25 hours a week. They bring home 98 to 135 dollars a week in their paycheck. You cannot afford a rent on that. You need to be able to make 10 or 12 dollars and work full time in our community to afford an apartment. So even though you have a job, you're still stuck in the shelter. That's a sad existence for our economy. We need good, affordable housing. We need good jobs with a livable wage so that people can afford to have an apartment of their own. I'm guessing that somebody in this room probably has a roommate that isn't their best roommate. Can you imagine sleeping last night with 67 not best roommates? You know, so think about the struggles that we have and how we learn to cohabitate and how difficult it is for people in a shelter setting to learn to get along with 40, 50, 60, 70, sometimes 100 people on any given night, and what that must be like for children. The average stay in emergency shelters, not just in our state, but throughout the country, used to be three to seven days. Now it's 30 to 45 days and moving upwards of four months because there's no affordable housing. If you don't have affordable housing, you can't get out of the shelter even if you get a job. Here in our small local shelter here in Maine, we've not had a family affordable housing voucher for over four months. So if you're in a shelter and you're three years old and you're there for four months, it becomes home. So yesterday we had a little boy visit us that was with us earlier this fall and his mother said he just keeps saying he wants to go home because they were with us for so long and it was the first time he'd slept the same place every night for a year and a half. It's nice that we became home but it's sad that affordable housing in an apartment of their own wasn't home that he would remember. So what do we do about that? We know all the stats. You know, we know that people 58 years old, we had a man that worked in a video store. He was a video store manager. What happened to video stores? They're gone. We're all red box and internet. What does a 58 year man do when he's homeless and is not qualified to do a different job? He's in the shelter. Even though we helped him get another job, it'll be five years before he makes what he did when he lost his job. In some areas, there's no affordable housing, just like here. We're not alone. There's no rooming houses, so if you make less, you can afford to be in a rooming house. So what do we do? Some people would say, well, it's just too big a problem, Betty. It's just too big. There's nothing that I can do. It's up to the politicians. There's nothing that I can give. There is. So let's talk a little bit about solutions while I also share some stories about other homeless folks. Let's talk about what you can do, because I believe that's how we end homelessness. One person, one family, one child at a time. One on one, you making the difference in a homeless person's life. So some people will say, well, I'm great at fundraising. Go fundraise. Give to your local shelter. Don't just buy somebody a cup of coffee on the corner. Invest in a homeless prevention program in your community. Your time, your finances, your gifts, whatever they might be. Volunteer at your local shelter. Each community can make a difference. I sat in a small community two days ago. We counted 11 homeless persons that had stayed in our shelter that have been from that community. 5,000 people live in that community. And I challenged them at that meeting, what if you were to build a homeless coalition in your own community, a community of 5,000 people coming together to say, we're going to end homelessness. Can 5,000 people end homelessness for 11? I hope so. It's my dream. How many people does it take to end homelessness one person at a time? One. It just takes you. If you do something about homelessness that you didn't do yesterday, then you've done something to change the face of homelessness. Don't be afraid to give away a piece of yourself to a homeless program in your community. Don't be afraid to share who you are to make a difference in homelessness. Early on this year, a 52-year-old woman showed up at the shelter and she said, I'm going to be homeless in four months. And I said, wow, that's good planning. And I said, how do you know you're going to be homeless in four months? And she said, because I'm $40 a month behind on my rent every month because I've been cut from 40 hours to 32 hours on my job. And so we talked about that a bit. And I said, well, go see your employer. And she said, no, he won't respect me. Everybody got cut. I can't ask him to do just me a favor. But we got permission to go to the employer on her behalf. He gave her back her hours. A local church helped to pay her back rent. And she's housed stably paying her own rent. That's community working together. 
That's 5,000 saving 11 to end homelessness. That's one person, an employer, making a difference in a person's life so that they're not homeless again, have all their dignity back, and can take care of themselves. One of the greatest things that homeless steals, being homeless steals from a person, is dignity, self-esteem, honor. We like to write in grants that there's no shame in being homeless, but we know that's not true. We know that people feel that on the street. We know for those of you that volunteer in local shelters and homeless programs, that you've seen and felt the shame of that. Yesterday, a middle schooler that came into our shelter sat at my desk and he cried. And he said, I play on the basketball team. He said, I don't want anybody on the basketball team to know that I'm in the shelter. What if nobody wants to play ball with me anymore? What if they don't pass me the ball in a basketball game? What if I can't make it to practices? What if I'm not as good because I share a room with another family? What if I can't sleep? I love basketball. It's the only thing in life I love. How can I be homeless and play basketball? That's the invitation of a community cry. We get on the phone, we call volunteers to make sure that he and his mom don't miss any practices or any basketball games and he's gonna have middle school basketball whether he's in our shelter or at home. But it takes a community to make that difference. Not a staff shelter, but a community that wants to be involved. Last year we got a call from a small local community and they said, we think we have a homeless woman and she's probably our only one. And I said, yes, maybe she is, but let's talk about it. And as we went out and met, they said there was this young woman that they saw walk in the streets of their very small town and she was very pregnant and that it had been raining for a week. Remember those of you last year, we suffered through all that rain? So we started driving out every day and we found this young woman pregnant about five days before due date. And she was in fact living in a tent in the woods in the pouring rain without what she needed. As we sat down and tried to talk her into coming into the shelter, she said, I can't come into the shelter, so social services will take my twin babies when they're born because they'll think I can't care for them. We convinced her that if she came into the shelter, so this social service would not take her twins, but that she would be warm and comfortable. 24 hours after she entered the shelter, she birthed beautiful twin babies here in our local hospital. It took six months to be able to move her out of the shelter. I'm so thankful for the six months that we rocked and cared for those beautiful twin babies, but six months is too long. You need to be rapidly housed in your own place, a place where you sit in your own chair, you sleep in your own bed, read your own books, Cook your own food so that you know that every day that life is going to be good and it's secure and that you can take care of your babies. The invitation of making difference in homelessness, again, is you. No one expects to be homeless. What if it was you? It's a full-time job to figure out how to survive on the street, from looking for a safe place to sleep, to where the free food programs are, to where you can go to be warm, where you can hide from the police, where you can hide from scary people, where you can be safe. If we work together on affordable housing and homeless prevention programs, I hope that in my lifetime, my dream is, and by the grace of God, we'll see that dream come true, that if we all work together, never again will we pull a woman from the woods in the pouring rain in a tent 24 hours before she gives birth to twins. Never again would I sit crying with a 77-year-old veteran that served in World War II, that had lost his place to stay and was too proud to come and ask. Never again, if we work together, will somebody's father, mother, brother, sister, son, or daughter be homeless for more than a day if we work together. The only failure I believe happens is when you quit. So the invitation is don't quit. Get involved somewhere. Make a difference for a homeless child in your community. Make a difference for a homeless vet in your community. Homelessness is not an epidemic just in Maine, but epidemic in our country. I dream. I pray that you dream. I pray that together, one day I stand on the stage for another TED Talks and say, Hallelujah, amen, I'm without a job, the shelter is closed, and homeless is gone. Thank you.